agenda. Yeah. I would uh, welcome all our participants and I would invite all of them to share uh, greetings in the chat, whether they want to present themselves and tell, tell us where they are following us from, uh, the university and the country. So please feel free to, um, to write and introduce yourself through the chat. And as well, while we move on in the discussion and in the presentation, there are many speeches today. So we have a lot to discuss and you can um, write in the chat any question uh, or comment which comes up. And then we will have a moment at the very end to present the questions and discuss um, your comments. So please feel free to join the conversation through the chat and we will start in a minute with the uh, welcome and then uh, with the speeches for seen for today's webinar. Hey Martina, can you please like um, just point out uh, to our colleagues where the chat is because some people they might uh, of course, of course. they it's, might not um, be familiar with it. Yeah. Uh, it's at the bottom of the Zoom window, you find uh, uh, um, uh, the, the chat button. It looks like, a, um, I don't know what's the word in English. Come si dice fumetto? Is it better now, the sound? A little bit. <laughs> a little better, but still a little far and noisy. All right, I think we can probably start. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And uh, so I will leave the floor to uh, our director, Marcello Scalisi, the director of uh, UNIMED, for a welcome to all the participants. We are now 26, so it's a pretty good number, and we hope more will come. Marcello, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Martina. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, I have, first of all, I would like to thank uh, our colleague from the University of Salento, in particular, Antonio Ficarella, for the efforts that uh, they are doing for this uh, sub-network. But I have also, in this occasion, uh, I have to thank also the, the University of Jordan, because it's, as you know, is one of our uh, strong partner in the region. Uh, probably the University of Jordan is one of the founding member of UNIMED. Uh, this year we celebrate 30 years of activity and uh, normally we have to celebrate this event, this anniversary in a month at the end of the year for our UNIMED assembly. We will see obviously depending by the situation. And this is the reason why I, first of all, I uh, thanks also Adil, Adil Yassin, uh, the director. Unfortunately, she is not with us today, but uh, also for her commitment, her engagement with us. And of course, the co-coordinator of our uh, sub-network on critical infrastructure, Dr. Mamoun Al-Rashidat. Sorry for my pronunciation. Um, I would like just to underline something related to all the activities of the sub-networks. This is a, 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 is a very important exercise, uh, not only to know better each other related to some particular thematic or some particular issues and for our common priorities, but because all these sub-networks that are, we are 
managing a unimet, as you know, guarantee a sort of secretariat in this case is guaranteed by Martina Zipoli, is a very important element to try to give us uh, food for reflection in some way. Uh, as you know, European Commission is working to prepare the new framework program for the Euro-Mediterranean cooperation, the new Erasmus Plus program, but also the new Horizon Europe program, uh, the program, the cooperation on research in particular. And all the information that we will collect through all these subnetworks will be very important for us to be prepared once we will have news and information from the future activity of uh, European Commission. Uh, recently, the European Commission published a, a new communication related to cooperation with Southern Mediterranean countries. There are many priorities, there are many actions to, uh, to be developed in some way. Uh, and one point very, very important is uh, related to the green dimension, which is something important for European policy but is also addressed to Southern Mediterranean countries. And I think that all the work that we can do together in this direction will be surely very well uh, welcome from the European Commission first, but also I think also from our colleagues of European uh, universities. I, again, I thank you very much for your active participation, for your discussion, I will I'm trying to follow all the activities of all our subnetworks, there are 12 subnetworks. Uh, but, you know, without your engagement, without your uh, participation and your discussion, it's impossible for us to conduct uh, very well uh, our networking dimension. Thanks again for your participation. Thanks to all the speakers of today. And I will be with you this morning to listen and to try to learn something. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Marcello. Thank you very much. And I will give the floor now to Reham Danun, representing the um, International Affairs Unit at the University of Jordan. Thank you, Thanks, Reham. The floor is yours. Thank you, Martina. Thank you, Dr. Marcello. Actually, I'm very pleased to join Dr. Marcello, the director of UNIMED, uh, in welcoming you to this first webinar of the subnetwork on safety and security of critical infrastructure. And I would like also to thank UNIMED for the establishment of this subnetwork that brings together research centers, university departments, faculties, academics, and researchers that work in the selected field. In order to favor scientific cooperation, the exchange of experiences and information, the strengthening of existing partnerships, and also to establish new collaborations in the Euro-Mediterranean region. We would also like to thank the University of Salento, the scientific coordinator of this subnetwork for their dedication, input, and vision for the subnetwork in the short and long term. The University of Jordan strategic, strategic priorities state the importance of national, regional, and international strategic partnerships in which Exchanging experiences comes as a strategic objective. Therefore, we are pleased to be selected as the subnetwork scientific co coordinator. We are glad to provide resources and work together to help uh, achieving the subnetwork goals and develop effective partnerships. I would like also to, to seize this opportunity to invite for a wide dissemination for the subnetwork. Uh, for, for a wide dissemination of the subject and its activities and in the upcoming events and webinars, etc. Uh, today's webinar uh, on security and the resilience of critical infrastructure in the water infrastructure comes in accordance with the theme of celebrating the World Water Day 2021, which is valuing water. The value of water is about much more than its price. Water has enormous and complex value for our household food, culture, health, education, economics, and the integrity of our natural, natural environment. Uh, I would leave the floor to the experts in the field to, to tell us much about the critical infrastructure in the field of water. I would only uh, to stress that the, we are looking forward to your speeches 
and wishing for exchange of great experiences and looking forward to further joint proposals, collaborative projects among our institutions in the near and to accomplish the, uh, our goal. Thank you so much. And uh, sorry, it's all yours. Dr. Ramon, please. Thank you, Riham. Thank you. And uh, I would like to welcome everybody this morning. And uh, if you allow me, I would like to request a, a moment of silence for the soul of our colleagues who passed yesterday. Uh, professor Dr. Hussein Masoud, he's a, a, a senior professor at the Department of Biological Sciences. Uh, he achieved a very significant contribution to the scientific community. And he's a, a very close uh, colleague and, and just adjacent to my office and he's close to our hearts. He's been uh, patiently struggling cancer for the last year and he passed yesterday. So please, if you can give us a moment of silence. And for us Muslims, we, we usually recite Surat Al-Fatiha. So may Allah bless their souls. Um, well, I would like to welcome you all to this um, first kickoff of a hopefully a series of fruitful webinars uh, on the topics of critical infrastructure. So uh, I would repeat my thank to UNIMED for give us the, uh, giving the University of Jordan this chance to um, collaborate and to uh, uh, be a, a, a lead on this uh, event and organizing it. I would like to uh, thank Marcelo on behalf of UNIMED and uh, to uh, thank uh, uh, our colleague Antonio from the University of uh, Salento and would like to thank uh, also Martina and Riham for your uh, excellent administrative and organizing work. Uh, uh, thank you, we would have uh, never been able to uh, synchronize all this event without your uh, excellent uh, help. Um, uh, this series of webinars is, is very important, I believe, for the European partners and the South partners, the Arab countries. And uh, we're hoping that uh, this kickoff meeting will initiate a series of very important topics on critical infrastructures in, in, in both regions. And uh, we'd like to thank our colleagues during our preparatory meetings that we've selected this water theme as the, the, the priority to, to start our series of webinars on water as Jordan is one of the uh, top three uh, scarce countries in water. And uh, this is a very important topic uh, for our country and I'm sure for all other countries. And as you know, water resources are depleting, the populations are increasing, and also uh, pollution is invading most of our resources globally. So uh, water is a, a very important issue and uh, it has to be tackled by all parties. So what we're hoping as the University of Jordan from this series of webinars is really to formalize an actual um, collaboration that will lead to fruitful uh, research, capacity building, uh, collaboration in terms of exchange of expertise between our countries. And hopefully this will um, mani be manifested during the, the coming weeks and months. Um, uh, also, I would like to, uh, mention one important topic about water, that also water is in, in very close proximity to energy. And uh, Jordan is also uh, facing challenges 
uh, in terms of energy. And uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Professor Ahmed, will be touching base with the uh, water energy nexus, which is uh, actually one of my expertise is producing biofuel from microalgae to refine water and to uh, make it better water and also to produce energy. Um, I would like all to thank all the participants for being with us today. And without any further ado, um, if you allow me to uh, uh, introduce our first speaker from the University of Salento, and uh, I might have to butcher the name now, as it's, it's very uh, hard for me, and I would like maybe Martina, if you can say the name, as I don't want to butcher it. May I? You are muted, uh, Martin. Yes, I was trying to unmute myself. I said I, I, I was. I'm not sure I'm able to pronounce it better than you would. But All right. Uh, we is... introduced Dr. Jaime Lai Aquaki. Probably you can say it better than we do, and he will present a speech from accurate leaking detection in waterworks using pressure sensors, advanced transforms based processing. Um, he's a speaker from the University of Salento, and we are very happy to have him with us today. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Emile Equaquil, very simple to pronounce. <laughs> and uh, we work uh, since 2004 in this topic uh, related to uh, sensors, instrumentation, measurement, and the signal processing. I will uh, try to share my my screen. Okay, I think that uh, you can see. And uh, we, 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 we try to, uh, uh, to give uh, a solution and a contribution in the field of um, um, uh, leak, de leak detection in uh, waterworks in uh, uh, pipe uh, line. Okay, uh, today we uh, I will uh, I would bring you to a, a quick journey to the uh, current methods we uh, we use in uh, in uh, in leak detection, and I will uh, uh, also bring you to, uh, to 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 see how it is possible to use advanced transforms usually um, um, employed in uh, in medical application, so that we can we can detect uh, leakage in uh, in uh, pipelines as uh, uh, we do we usually do for 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 arteries and uh, veins in uh, human uh, human uh, beings. So uh, the question is, we have a, a kind of deterioration of uh, the material uh, we use for, for, for water walks. So every day uh, we need uh, to use water. So we, we close, we open valves. Uh, there is a risk of corrosion and uh, so on. Um, in practice, we can, we can set the uh, into uh, uh, categories the reason of water loss. Um, in our uh, left, we can see uh, pipe uh, breaks and the leaks, which is the common item we uh, encounter in our uh, daily life. Uh, we have the question of storage overflows and uh, uh, house connection leaks. In uh, our uh, right, uh, we have the problem of uh, uh, error, um, uh, loss of accuracy in metering. In this case, the problem deal with the, with the, the, the company, uh, the, 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 the public company. So um, we can see uh, from the European Union uh, statistics, um, we can reach uh, a, a peak of uh, uh, fifty percent of loss of water, in this case in uh, in uh, air, so in uh, in uh, South Ireland, 
And um, for instance, in the Mediterranean area, uh, in some uh, cities, uh, uh, I would like to omit uh, the name of these cities, uh, the loss of water can reach uh, 60 and uh, uh, 70 percent. So it is necessary, it is necessary to uh, envisage uh, techniques um, allowing to detect uh, maybe automatically uh, the, the deterioration of the material architecture of the uh, waterworks. So uh, we can see uh, the, the, the broad uh, classification of the leak detection methods. In general, um, people working in the field of uh, hydraulics uh, uh, try to use, in your right, you can see uh, um, software-based methods, for instance, mass or volume balance, and uh, for us, working in the field of sensors and measurement, we propose, uh, we prefer to use pressure point analysis. And in your uh, left, you can see the common hardware techniques such as acoustic, cable sensor along the pipe, fiber optic, uh, uh, how to monitor the uh, leaks on the soil by using uh, different other techniques. So we, I give you uh, uh, an outline of some uh, uh, hardware uh, methods. You can see a, 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 a TDR uh, methods. So this is a time domain reflectometry you, ne you need uh, to, to put uh, uh, along close to the pipe uh, a wire, uh, in this case, uh, two wires serving as antenna uh, with uh, a, a, an instrumentation uh, related to TDR, you need to, uh, to launch uh, a, a, a current and uh, to see the, uh, uh, what is the, the value uh, of this current and the changes uh, on, on the structure of the, of the material uh, related to the pipe uh, gives you uh, uh, um, something wrong on the quality of the material. But it is not a permanent system you need uh, at your earliest convenience to go to uh, select a, a pipe and to, to launch this uh, current. The, uh, another techniques is um, acoustic emission sensing. Um, it is a passive, it is, also, it is also an active method. You need to put the uh, uh, acoustic emission sensors close to a flange uh, and to see the vibration uh, close to this uh, flange. So um, it is also, in my opinion, it is, it could be uh, uh, cheaper than uh, TDR. And uh, the third uh, method uh, using hardware uh, is the laser Doppler vibrometer. So, uh, you need to, uh, to target the pipe with a laser and you capture the retrieved information to be processed according to this uh, algorithm. Okay, so um, you need to have this kind of instrumentation targeting the pipe close to the pipe. And uh, we um, we, can, we can also uh, use uh, a, a, a software, I think, a, a drawback, a compromise between a software and a, a hardware method. Uh, here, you can use a, an imaging um, uh, looking for the rotation of, uh, uh, for instance, a house flow meter. You fix a point 
and you can see the uh, angular rotation from one point to another point. You need a camera. This kind of uh, approach is useful in, uh, in uh, I think, in a company, in, in industrial site, because uh, of the cost of the uh, camera, of the, uh, the magnetic um, system. Uh, 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 it is valid for conductive liquids. So we calculate in real time, we get the uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the velocity of the, uh, of the liquid, in this case of the water. We know the section, we know the section of the pipe, so we can determine the uh, mass and the, the volume of the uh, liquids inside the, uh, the pipe. So um, let me uh, um, go in depth um, about the uh, today um, uh, key, uh, uh, keynote. So we think that it is possible uh, uh, for the uh, strategic aspects of, uh, of uh, mm, pipelines, so waterworks, to have a system uh, which is uh, cheaper, uh, which is, which is uh, automatic, allowing to detect in, uh, uh, I think, real time uh, in some points of the city of the, of the waterworks, the amount of the flow, and at the same time, the, uh, the point where uh, the, we have the, the lake. Uh, very simple, because it is based on the uh, spectral analysis. Here we have uh, a pipe with the two sensors mounted on, on the pipe. We have an initial break, uh, and uh, um, suddenly we have a negative pressure. Okay, so this is the, the, the classical approach in spectral analysis. For us, having the experience in, uh, in, in uh, biomedical, we uh, consider that this negative pressure, this is the point where we, we have the leakage, as a, a, a thrombosis, as it is, it is done in the, in the human. So the question is, the question is, this is in green, the theoretical uh, spectrum, and uh, we measure, thanks to the, uh, the, the uh, pressure sensor, the uh, real spectra, and we put, we make a comparison. If there is no matching, this is a leak. So um, we exploit the, uh, uh, the scintillation phenomena of the uh, water molecules along the uh, pipe. So um, the question is, once we get uh, the signal, this signal should be expressed as a sum of uh, damped sinusoids with the 2K, the K, this K is the unknowns. So um, we have to detect, uh, to solve this, this equation by detecting the amplitude and detecting the phase. Okay, since we, as I told you before, we are dealing with the, we consider the pipe as, uh, as getting the, 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 in terms of uh, comparison with the human uh, vein, human artery, capillary. So we can uh, just apply some uh, uh, theory of uh, quantum physics in particular, the equation related to beta uh, vice secar mass formula uh, in the, the decaying uh, process. So we, uh, we try to use the same algorithms, uh, um, uh, people working in the field of quantum physics uh, uh, usually uh, try to implement. So we consider the leak as in the pipeline, 
as the, the pipeline as a vascular system with arteries, veins, and capillaries. So a leakage is similar to a thrombosis. In this context, we can use FDM, uh, filter diagonalization method, and so on. So uh, this is uh, the uh, sensor we mounted on our pipe in, uh, in the lab. We have a, 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 a pump uh, 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 pumping water in the hydraulic socket. This is an, a, another, a, another example, a common example, where we have uh, uh, in, in a normal uh, uh, water works, we have a sensor and close to, to this sensor or transducer, we have an antenna uh, transmitting to, the, uh, to the, the central system, all information related to the, uh, the flow and related to the uh, leakage uh, occurring in this branch of the pipeline. So uh, we try to use the, 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 the FDM uh, algorithm. Uh, we realized in our lab a double uh, uh, system, uh, which a, a first branch of uh, 70 meters hung on the wall. It is a zigzag system with the one inch as a section a diameter. Um, why we decided to hang the system on the wall and to use a zigzag system? Because we needed to stress uh, the architecture of this kind of, uh, 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 of uh, water works. In order to um, stressing the system, we will represent all conditions uh, existing in, uh, in the world. We used the FDM we proposed. Uh, this is the FFT uh, we currently use. You can see that the error, uh, the, the difference of between the uh, theoretical distance and the correct and the detected distance is minimal in the case of FDM. The question, the, 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 the um, the, the improvement is in the uh, resolution. Uh, the, the spectrum of FFT is truncated, while in FDM it is not. Okay? Um, we uh, use another uh, technique uh, called decimatic signal uh, diagonalization. Um, Excuse me, Amy. Term, I would like to tell you that FDM is the best technique, very robust, but uh, in case of uh, complicated uh, networks, it is difficult to, 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 to get uh, in time the result. So uh, computationally speaking, it takes uh, more time than DSD, but uh, the DSD is, uh, um, uh, is useful when we think that uh, we, we, we don't like to, to um, um, we don't like to represent all the information on the spectrum. This is the uh, comparison between the uh, FDM and the DSD. Uh, this is the, uh, the second part of the water works you can see in our lab at the University of Salento in Lecce. And uh, uh, we can see that there is, according to the regression, we have to use um, uh, the first part, as I told you before, is 70 meters. And the second part, it is an ascending, ascending part. And the second part overlapped here is a descending part. You can see that there is a difference uh, deciding uh, in the descending part from leaks, uh, from leak seven up to 11, you can see a difference if we use a linear regression in order to retrieve uh, data, there is a difference, there is a difference. Uh, DSD is more accurate than FDM, okay? This is the question of the spectrum. Okay, so- the um, Excuse me, Amy. How, how long is uh, 
left for your presentation? Because we uh, agreed just, on 15 I, I'm minutes. I'm concluding. Yeah. I'm concluding. Okay, thank you. Okay. The, um, uh, the, 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 the further technique is uh, uh, DPA, decimated approximant. Uh, we can use also for network. And the last technique is the uh, decimated linear predictor. So uh, in this case, uh, it is just for a low flow network, okay? And uh, mm, what, uh, what is the, 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 the final outlook? Uh, we are working on uh, using a camera, small camera in, uh, in the pipe. This is if the, uh, if the, 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 the water or the fluid is not uh, harmful, but we can also use a, a robot for monitoring inside the pipe uh, what, what is happening. Okay, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Amy, thank you so much. Um, and uh, our attending colleagues, um, it would be nice if you have any questions to post them on the chat. And we will leave all your questions to the last session uh, led by Martina to have a debate and a QA session. So, uh, and without any further ado, we're gonna be moving to our next speaker, um, Dr. Khaldon Shatmawi. He is the director of uh, Water, Energy and Environment Center at the University of Jordan. And he will be, uh, his talk will be about long-term water security under climate change. Uh, Dr. Khaldun, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. Uh, just allow me a second to upload uh, to to share my screen. Uh, can you view the screen? Sure. Okay. Uh, well, actually, uh, since Jordan is part of this network, uh, my presentation will focus more of on the on the water situation in, in Jordan. Uh, I'm not going into a more detailed research uh, approach, more than giving a general idea about the situation of water in Jordan and what are we what are we doing uh, to adapt with the changing we are uh, now facing. So. Overall, uh, we will have a fast look observed to at the observed and projected climate change at a global level. And then we will look at the impacts of climate change and then the adaptation uh, to climate change in Jordan. So at a global level, uh, if we look at uh, four criteria, temperature, precipitation, and if droughts and floods. So we'll start with temperature. What has been observed, and this is according to the IPCC 2012, what have been observed since 1950 is very likely decrease in the number of usual cold days and nights, very likely increase in the number of unusual warm days and nights. Also an increase in the length or the number of warm spills or heat waves in many regions. So uh, the, the, the slide is, is into three parts. So what has been observed since 1950, the attribution of the observed changes and what is projected changes for the year till the year 2000 and uh, 2100. So uh, regarding the projected till 2100, it is virtually certain decrease in the frequency and magnitude of usually cold days and nights, virtually certain that there's an increase in the frequency and magnitude of unusual warm days and nights. Very likely increase in the length, frequency, and intensity of warm spills or heat waves over most land area. And we've been witnessing that, those changes in the last few years more frequently. So this is regarding the temperature. When looking at precipitation, it is likely statistically significant to see an increase uh, that we saw an increase in the number of heavy precipitation events in more regions than those with statistically significant decreases. So we are witnessing more heavy 
rain, high intensity, short duration uh, events. What is expected for the future, there is likely increase in the frequency in heavy precipitation events. Now, these heavy precipitation events, even not talking about the annual precipitation or the distribution of precipitation, just considering the, these events, these are the events that cause the floods that we are uh, recently in many parts of the world are facing. And also on the other side the, uh, of the extreme is where we would see the drought. So looking at the drought since 1950, we have medium confidence that some regions of the world have experienced more intense and longer droughts, particularly Southern Europe and West Africa, but opposite of trends also exist. Uh, for the year 2100, medium confidence in projected increase in duration and intensity of droughts in some regions of the world, including Southern Europe and the Mediterranean region. So uh, we are facing and we will be facing more drought events than what we are uh, usually used to. Regarding the floods, there is limited, since the last 50 years, there is limited to medium evidence available to assess climate-driven observed changes in the magnitude and frequency of floods at regional scale. And there is a low agreement in this evidence and so low confidence at the global scale regarding even signs of these changes. However, uh, given the changes in precipitation that we are seeing, this is leading to uh, more frequent flood events. So for the next, uh, till the year 2100, there is low confidence in global projection of changes in flood magnitude and frequency because of sufficient, insufficient evidence. Medium confidence that projected increase in heavy precipitation would contribute to rain generated local flooding in some catchments or regions very likely earlier spring, spring peak flows in snowmelt and glacier fed rivers. So uh, this is overall the global uh, uh, general overlook over climate change. Now, what are the impacts of this climate change? On the water resources, there is a decrease, a drought, uh, uh, there's a drought and consequent impact on the water and sanitation infrastructure. There is a loss of biodiversity, the biodiversity and natural ecosystem. The timing of the climate variability may be as important as its magnitude. We can see that there's an increased soil erosion process, and this is mainly caused by the flood. And there's a loss of lives and good. This is caused by wildfire, heat waves, and floods. There is severe yield reduction. And for example, a study showed that each degree day spent above 30 degrees Celsius can reduce yield by 1.7% under drought conditions. Uh, climate variability and extreme events can also be important to yield quality. So high temperature extreme can affect the protein content in the wheat grain and changing in the livestock productivity due to grassland reduction and variability of species and composition. So these are the impacts that globally have been, uh, the world have been facing. Jordan specifically have already suffered some of these impacts in which I will talk about uh, in, in the coming slide. So a summary of the impacts, I will divide it into three main parts. Food system and security, human health, water and sanitation infrastructure. So this is basically, we are summarizing uh, the, the impact of, on, for example, on the agricultural production and livestock survival and production. Vulnerable groups are most negatively affected impacts on community prices at global market. It affects the human health in many different indirect and indirect ways. So Directly, uh, diseases such as malaria and cholera are highly affected by changes in flood and drought patterns. Indirectly, you can say climate change leads to changes in temporal and spatial variation in vegetation and water distribution. So 
Now, talking about Jordan, Jordan's population is about 10 million, a little bit more now than 10 million. 80% of Jordan is considered arid and semi-arid areas. It is considered the second largest refugee, ref, refugee host in the world. So, uh, and we, we are talking only about official number. Uh, the unofficial number of refugees are much higher than the official numbers, but only looking at the official number of refugees, we have like about 1.3 million Syrian refugee in Jordan. We have about 0.7 Iraqi refugee in 0.7 million. So uh, we have many refugees in Jordan. It is hosting and it is uh, affecting and stressing our water resources. So some facts about uh, Jordan uh, in the water sector. The total precipitation in Jordan is about 8.21 billion cubic meter a year. And that's over an area of 90,000 kilometers square. Of that rain, we lose 93% to evaporation and only 2.1 goes to runoff and 4.4% is groundwater recharge. So, uh, which give us a total annual precipitation of 92 millimeter per year. And this is very low. Uh, the capita share of water in Jordan is less than 100 meter cube per capita per year. And it is estimated to reach about less than 90 in, uh, meter cube per capita per year in 2025. If we look at the 60s, the share the per capita was 3,600 meter cube per capita. The scarcity level is 1,000 meter cube per capita per year. So or we are considered one of the 10 poorest countries in water in the world. And they classify it keep, uh, through the Ministry of Water and Irrigation that we are the second uh, uh, poorest country. So our renewable water resources are 8.5 billion cubic meter. The demand for water is more than 1,500 million cubic meter. And the supply that the government can provide is 1,100 million cubic meter. So we can see that there's a big deficit between the demand and the supply. And there's a big deficit between the supply and the renewable. So our supply is actually uh, distributed that 45% goes to domestic, about 50% to agriculture, and 3% to industry. The way we use the supply, the supply water, we, we withdraw it from 27% from the surface water, about 60% from groundwater. And now the treated wastewater in Jordan is considered one of its renewable water resources and which counts for 14% of our supplied water. We have 12 groundwater basin in which 10 are over pumped. So we have an over pumping of 200 million cubic meter a year. This have led to an uh, average drop in ground level by around two meter per year, if we take it as an average, but we have some areas, these are the all extremely over pumped areas we have experience and a drop in groundwater level from five to 20 meter a year. So looking at the climate change from at a local level. Now, according to the climate change policy for resilient water sector in Jordan 2016, uh, we can see that uh, there is a mean and maximum temperature change of about two to point is from, from two to four degrees higher, precipitation will be reduced by 15 to 20%, and runoff will also reduce by 20 to 30%. And we can see here the temperature change for Jordan River Basin for two different climate changes. And we can see how does the temperature is expected to increase over uh, the, the uh, long period of time. So the main message, although the research in Jordan on a 
regional scale and on a national scale of climate change has not been enough. However, global models with high accuracy should be enough to create action. So we should focus on action and be more resilient. So absorb the disturbance while maintaining structures and function. The impacts of climate change on Jordan. Actually, just about these pictures shown here, these top two pictures, these are River Jordan in the 60s. So we could see that the river had actual flow in it. The annual flow was about 1,300 million cubic a year. So these two photos are in the 1962-63. Now, currently in good years and in some years, this is the flow of Jordan River the picture in the middle. Unfortunately, in summer, and uh, this is the flow that Jordan River is sometimes uh, facing. So we can see that there's almost no flow. This is at the top of the Dead Sea exactly. So. Dr. Khaldun, so, if you can conclude, please. Of what? Um, one minute left. Okay. So uh, regarding the agriculture, uh, we can see an increase in the, see, I have limited time. At the beginning, I was informed that it, it, it is a longer presentation, but I was shocked to see it, that it was a 15. So I'm going to skip some slides now and just move to the uh, uh, impact, uh, if you allow me. And the presentation will be short and it will cont uh, contains all the information uh, needed. So, but for example, let's talk about the floods. We have witnessed an increased frequency in the floods in Jordan. Uh, it is affecting the soil erosion. It affecting uh, crops and trees, the infrastructure and buildings, and the well-being of people. Examples of the recent flood that we have witnessed is the Zarqa Ma'in flood in 2018, where we lost more than 21 uh, uh, kids. Uh, Petra, we had two events in 2018. We have downtown Amman that is recently facing many floods. The last was in 2019. And Aqaba, one of the biggest floods we had was in 2012. So studies have been made towards uh, 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 trying to solve the problem. And this is part of the studies done in Amman, part of the studies done in, in, in Petra. Other impacts are the decrease in the groundwater recharge, soil erosion, uh, deterioration of the water quality, and so. Action has been taken by the government university and many NGO and other governments. So for the adaptation, we need to first enhance the water supply. And this could be done by adaptation in the sanitation and reuse in the subsector in Jordan. We can uh, work in the water supply by trying to find additional water resources. We have recently uh, constructed the DC water conveyor project, which pumps over 100 million cubic meter of water to our Amman. We have the national uh, conveyor. Uh, this started in 2020, and it is supposed to pump water from uh, Aqaba to Amman in two phases each. The first phase is 150 million cubic meter. It will be upgraded in the second phase to reach 250 million cubic meter. The Dead Sea, and I will try to finish in less than a minute. The Red Dead Sea conveyor project is now semi-canceled, uh, but it was a project that we should have focused more on and we still need to try to refresh this project and bring it back uh, to life because of what it will do to the uh, Dead Sea. So, because this is the Dead Sea that is expected in 2050. Regarding the water demand management, this is another adaptation that we can take, the capacity building and water policy, and finally research and technology. Uh, in this part, for example, we are having now a project called Reservoir Project, which is sustainable groundwater resources management by integrating earth observation, derived monitoring, and flow modeling results. And we are taking the Azraq uh, wetland reserve as 
uh, which is one of the most overcome uh, watershed uh, basins in Jordan. Now, do the public of Jordan realize the threats imposed on the country by climate change? Uh, we need to work a little bit more on the awareness of people and the should, public should be involved and aware of the consequences of climate change. I'm sorry it took a little bit longer and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Khaldun. Um, and I apologize for this miscommunication. Um, um, so we were not clear enough that we have 10 to maximum 15 minutes. Um, uh, well, thank you for this uh, presentation. Anyways, as uh, Dr. Khaldun mentioned, uh, Martina will be posting all the presentations on UNIMED website and uh, the uh, presentation is already recorded for the uh, participants who wish to attend the seminar again. And uh, now uh, we're moving to uh, uh, Dr. Rana Samara uh, from the Faculty of Agriculture Sciences and Technology um, from Palestine Technical University, Khaduri. Uh, Dr. Rana, Fadali. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us today for the, uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, allow me to share my screen with you. Uh, I will be uh, talking about the strategic uh, approach to climate change in adaptation for agriculture and uh, ecosystem resilience. Uh, some of the uh, ideas that I will be about have been mentioned uh, by uh, Dr. Khaldun earlier. So in um, a perspective of the climate change impact on agriculture, the warmer temperature has increased uh, uh, during the last century, has increases the growing season, reducing the winter and heating, uh, which increases the cooling cost of the greenhouses and production. Many of the insects and pests have been able to attack uh, uh, more crop because they can survive winter because it is warmer winter. Uh, the precipitation uh, uh, amount of water have been uh, uh, either increasing or decreasing, which have increased the impact of uh, the distribution of water. Uh, droughts uh, have been uh, also an issue uh, due to a drier summer and uh, uh, more on uh, demanding on water. A hotter, higher summer increased requirement of irrigation, which um, we need more and more and more on water supply with limited resources and refresh of the recharging of water. And we have uh, seen a more uh, in productions of new crops that can be either tolerant to the climate change or the drought conditions. So, if we are looking at the climate change, we are uh, considering the change in other of weather conditions or in the term of variation of weather around longer and average conditions, which can be caused by uh, two uh, uh, factors, either natural causes of the climate change and a human causes. The natural causes could, could be uh, the uh, have naturally had cycle of climate change that occurred eventually, the, the solar energy that the uh, uh, output can change in the natural environment. Uh, each average temperature in three hot areas is uh, increased. A uh, human activity has a, a, a very important um, impact on uh, climate change by increasing greenhouse gas emissions, uh, pollution gases uh, from factories, deforesting, and uh, the increase of population in the world. So uh, the change uh, in the climate uh, in climate change by very um, excuse me, Dr. Rana. Yeah. Um, it, it, it may, the 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 internet quality at your end it's it's kind of slow. So if you can disable your video, maybe this will provide a better sound quality. Or make the mic closer to your mouth, maybe. Yeah. Just either, the like, the voice you, is the voice is not clear. No. Now it's now it's good. Now it's good. Okay. Okay. So if we continue about the diverse, uh, the diverse of change either by political uh, uh, process, through pollution uh, 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 of the water quality, the climate, the acidification and overfishing and uh, different habitats, 
uh, or it can affect by human choices due to policies and legal systems, uh, market demand and the labor flow and demographic changes and cultural all have an impact on the uh, climate change. So how do crops resile the climate change? Normally, the response of the crop uh, to the climate change either by the extension or uh, uh, rain shift, habitat fragmentation, genetic diversity, uh, diversification, migration, and phenotypic plasticity. Which means that in extension, we can uh, predict that many of the wildlife species have been uh, threatened by extension, mostly the amphibian and reptile and invertebrates will be in danger due to the climate change. And most of the continents that will be forced or in danger for the impact of climate change will start with North America, Australia, and the ocean. So this is a, 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 a very important challenge for different continents and different wildlife species that will be suffering from the climate change. Another impact on the climate change is the rain shift. Normally, the plant distribution around the uh, globe of the growth, uh, we can see in the 30 years of warmer conditions, there will be a shift in the, uh, the, the slope and upbringing of the crop. That means that part of the distribution of many crops will be shifted according to the uh, 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 warmer conditions and co uh, warmer uh, climatic uh, conditions around the uh, uh, globe. Another important impact on the climate change is habitat fragmentation. That means that it will, uh, the habitat will be reduced in the area with increasing the, uh, the, the distance between these uh, areas that means that species will be able, uh, will have difficulty to uh, uh, be inserted into a new area, and it will increase the pressure on the biodiversity. Another impact on the uh, climate change on uh, uh, wildlife is the migration. We can see that many uh, 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 insect species and uh, wildlife have been starting to migrate up north or south due to the increase on the temperature or warmer temperature in the Mediterranean region, and they tend to go to the northern, northern, uh, northern countries because it is more uh, adaptable to the uh, 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 environmental conditions. So uh, according to many researchers, we can see um, a, a lot of migration of tropical plants due, due to the climate change, some crop migrate north with warmer temperature increases. Climate change has changes in the agriculture and climate warm conditions have forced species to migrate to a new area of new location. So another impact on the climate change is the impact on the pollinators and natural enemies. Pollinators have a very important uh, function in agriculture sector, which is first uh, in agriculture, more than 87% uh, 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 plant species in a food crop out of 115 uh, plants require pollinators. It is very important for the biodiversity of the species and the habitat. More than 87% of flower plants require insect pollinators. Losing these pollinators can force extension and collapse of the pollinator plant community. With climate change, the adaptation, there is a cross pollination in, enhanced in genetic diversity, which is very uh, endangering the uh, diversity on the, uh, um, in the global agriculture sector. Many pollinators and on crop to give higher revenue and water pollinators and independent crop. Finally, pollinators serve as a basic to all the ecosystem services that can, if we lose these pollinators, a lot of interlink will increase the uh, poverty spiral. Do you know?
know that these crops have required presence of pollinators. Some crops do not need pollinators. As we can see here, like more of uh, the uh, uh, crops need more pollinators than the others, like more than 90% of uh, uh, these crop species requires the presence of pollination through insects. So, and more other crops need a less uh, or dependent on the presence of the uh, presence of pollinator to uh, uh, have uh, their uh, pollination. If we look at the uh, increase in agricultural dependency on pollinator between the 60s and 2012, uh, 2012 we can see most of our, re our region in the Mediterranean and in uh, Latin America and in uh, uh, Asia will suffer more from the losses of the uh, pollinators according to uh, the, uh, these studies. So uh, the increase on uh, losing pollination uh, to wildlife and animals will increase a uh, uh, lot of losses in most of the crops in these regions. The impact of climate change uh, on drought, uh, uh, due to the climate change, we can see that uh, we have a lot, uh, uh, many cases on drought, which can lead to land degradation, or it can reduce the availability of food and increase the prices of the food, which affects the food security. If we look at the drought impact on the agricultural system, we can see that they will reduce the availability of water and grass and reduce the fed available for animal husbandry, which will increase the prices on these resources. And these this will force the uh, farmer either to sell their uh, cattle or that it will impact the livestock and the productivity, which will affect also the food security. If we look at the climate change on the fishery and aquaculture, uh, climate change can lead to different biophysical changes, either on ocean, uh, ocean current, the El Nino impact, the sea level rise the rainfall, the ripple, and many other factors which will affect the productivity, the fish, fishing and aquaculture, the community on the livestock and the wild society, which will also impact the species composition, composition, production, distribution, diseases, and safety and adaptation and market impact. The Projection of the effect on future catch potential between 2005 and 2050, there is a module that expected that the changes in the uh, uh, climatic change will uh, increase the suffer for most of the uh, con continent, especially in Latin, in the southern areas and in the north areas in the continent due to the loss of the fishing and what impact on the aquaculture. The global map of national economic vulnerability of climatic change, we can see that most of the countries in will be having a high risk and uh, 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 due to the climate change will be in the uh, north part of the continent and in Latin America and in uh, 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 South and uh, Western and Africa due to the impact of uh, climate change on fishery and aquaculture. So according to the uh, World Bank, climate change is likely to increase world poor uh, for more than 100 million uh, people. Most of the uh, continent will be affected in Africa and uh, Asia due to the climate change. So, uh, climate change will increase, result in 20% increase in the malnutrition of children by 2050. So how can we prepare ourselves in response to the impact of climate change? We can either ecological, economic, and, and social resilience by implementing a system to approach agriculture, forestry, and fishery and aquaculture, in, uh, in, uh, the income diversification flexible access to the right of public and private insurance. Another uh, approach is by technology innovation, 
using different techniques in seeds and species in IT to improve the resilience and, uh, uh, of the climate change. Uh, planning and production of policy that will increase water and agriculture and forestry in different regions and disaster prevention and responses. So the key feature to a system approach basic uh, on the objective by maintaining ecosystem integrity, ecological well-being, improving human well-being and equity, uh, promoting and enabling uh, good governance. So comprehensive strategy of the uh, build resilience is important to identify and uh, understand all the rest. Uh, uh, Anna, I, like yeah. One minute left, please. Okay. So we have to do the uh, uh, vulnerability system and to uh, you, uh, uh, reduce the risk and organize the compensation. One of the uh, different uh, approaches is building resilience through uh, forestries, uh, tools to profit uh, the uh, management of risk building the adaptation capacity to change, especially uh, the addressing the uncertainty through animal genetic, genetic resources and diversification and integrated watershed management through uh, integration forest uh, farming, uh, mosaic farming and land plan development through practitionary process. And in the dry land agroforestry system, we can use the mosaic crop fields and or we can use the uh, parkland agroforestry system. Finally, we can uh, have the policy institution and support by the Supreme Coordination national and international policy and the strong local institution and to conserve uh, the uh, pollinator diversity and enhance climate change to different uh, strategies and policy. Thank you. For, sorry for any uh, delay and um, in this, No, just uh, in time. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Dr. Just in time. Um, again, a reminder for our participants, uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, uh, post them on the chat. And uh, now we're moving to a uh, presentation about water and energy mixes uh, presented by uh, Professor Dr. Ahmed Al-Salaimi. Uh, from the Faculty of Engineering, the University of Jordan. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, Fadlan. Dr. Ahmed, can you hear me? He was just with us like a minute ago. Maybe he lost connection. Um, we can. He's with us. I, I can see him uh, among the speakers, but maybe um, either we can move to the next. Yeah, one. we can. Yeah, we can. Uh, we can move to the next speaker, Dimitrios. Uh, are you with us? Yes. Hi, everybody. Sure. Hello. So now we're moving. We're, we're going to be coming back to with Dr. Ahmed later on. Uh, so now we're moving to a, a, another topic about security and emergency response technologies for smart water networks uh, presented by uh, Dr. Dimitrios Iliades. I hope I... Perfect. It right. Yes, yes, yeah. that was perfect presentation. Uh, from uh, KIOS Research and Innovation Center of Excellence from the University of uh, Cyprus. Uh, the floor of you is yours, please. Yes. Uh, can you see my screen? Sure. Perfect. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Dimitris Iliadis. I'm a research assistant professor at the GEOS uh, Center of Excellence at the University of Cyprus. Um, just a short, um, just a short um, um, uh, introduction with, with regards to the, to the Center of Excellence. Uh, this is the largest ICT center, research center in Cyprus. It's at the faculty level of, at the University of Cyprus, and it's essentially a strategic collaboration of the University of Cyprus and Imperial College London. It currently employs more than 165 uh, staff, mostly uh, PhDs in the area of electrical and computer engineering. And uh, we also have the Innovation Hub, 
uh, where we have a strong collaboration with the local partners, for instance, Waterport, as well as at the region, uh, for instance, with the Arab Water Council. Um, in addition, we organized a master's on intelligent critical infrastructure systems with uh, Imperial College and UCY faculty. And we are leading, we are leading a number of um, uh, high profile Horizon 2020 proposals uh, and projects, sorry, uh, related to water and water security. Now, uh, let me start with, uh, with, uh, with the topic and, 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 and let me start with the real crisis that occurred in 2007 uh, in Nokia and Finland when uh, more than 400,000 liters of wastewater were injected into the city at that location. Within uh, 48 hours, the contamination has spread uh, throughout uh, a large part of the city. After three days, the water utility was able to confirm the event and establish a command and control center to manage, uh, to manage the situation. And after 10 days, they were, they were actually able to control the situation. Um, so um, this is a simulation of what, uh, what happened. And they did this a uh, few months after, after the event was uh, occurred. Uh, so the question is, could we have this map in real time during the event? And could we, use this, could we use this information to reduce the time for managing this type of events? Um, as you can understand, um, this was a very critical issue for, for that city. On the right, you see the number of hospitalizations due to uh, health issues. Uh, what was happened was that the, there was an illegal pipe connection uh, connecting the wastewater treatment plant with the drinking water distribution system. So, uh, and I, if you if you can imagine it, let me show you a picture. So, more or less, this is what happened. So, uh, the key question now is how we can help water utilities prepare for these type of events. Uh, one way is to prepare for and plan for water security. They can do this by preparing um, a water security plan. And essentially, the JRC in, in the EU uh, suggested the following uh, parts, uh, making this plan, um, having the planning and preparation phase, the protection and event detection phase, the emergency response and event management, as well as the recovery. Now, let me show you some technologies that we are working on that can uh, apply, uh, that can be applied in this framework. So first, let me start by preparing for an event. And the first thing is to be able to uh, examine different scenarios in a virtual environment so for, the, for this reason, we have developed a realistic virtual city. Uh, it's based on a realistic si um, city in Cyprus using open data. It integrates different simulators, water, power, transportation, and telco. And we also model the interdependencies. And we can use this. It's an open research platform that can be used for research, training, benchmarking, et cetera. And uh, I will be using this for the next uh, examples that I'm going to show. So, this is a virtual city, and the first problem is decide where to install water quality sensors. So because, they, because of the high cost, you cannot really install a lot of sensors within the water distribution system. And in fact, it's a multi-objective system because you want to minimize the contamination impact and at the same time minimize the detection delay. And you can use different type of risk-based metrics. Uh, and in general, it's a very typical problem. Just for this problem that I'm showing right now, there are 10 to the power of 12 solutions. And we can, uh, we can apply different techniques to find the best solution. So by applying, for instance, this methodology, we can identify that this configuration of sensors is much better suited than the previous one, and it's closer to the Pareto front of solutions. Um, and, we have, and for this, we have developed also tools to help water operators uh, in an, use, use these techniques in, a, in an easy and intuitive way. And also, uh, we have developed games for them to understand a bit better how they can actually uh, and they, they understand the different uh, objectives in, or in optimizing uh, sensor placement. Now, another issue is about estimated water quality. So now we have the sensors, the chlorine sensors, for instance, installed in the city. The idea now is to incorporate these sensor measurements and actually estimate what's happening everywhere in the system. And we're using um, an, an analytical method in order to compute, for instance, uh, the, the chlorine concentrations at locations where we do not have sensors. And by also considering the demanding reaction uncertainties, we can also create bounds. So now what we have is that we have a small number of sensors within the system, and we use those sensors with mathematical models and create what uh, chlorine concentrations to expect at different locations in the system, as well as their bounds. And we can use this 
afterwards for contamination detection. Now, before, to, before doing the detection part, first we want to be able to ensure that we have a good disinfection control. Here we can use uh, multiple, uh, we can use booster chlorination and we have been developing techniques for, uh, for real-time uh, control uh, of, of chlorine by using multiple chlorine boosters. Um, and, um, and this is a very promising technique that can also be used not just for regulating chlorine concentrations, but also uh, for responding to contamination events during an emergency. Another part is, is, is uh, cyber physical security. And uh, you can see a simple network on the left. Uh, what happens, for instance, when you want to control a tank is that the tank um, uh, sends information of the sensor level uh, at, at the PLC at the pump, and the, then the pump is activated or not. However, if there is an attack on the PLC due to a cyber or physical attack, then the, essentially uh, this is rendered uh, useless. So what we are developing is that uh, we have these um, um, evolving techniques where we, uh, we utilize information using analytical, analytical redundancies to actually use information from other type of sensors and models in order to be able to repeat and use uh, to reproduce this uh, control and, and have the system uh, be more uh, resilient. Uh, we have extended this approach also uh, for, to minimize physical, uh, physical to mi to, uh, attacks, physical attacks by finding the optimal combination of security measures. For instance, in this case, we need to apply, we can apply a fenced area and then we can have patrols and then we can have alerts. And this will minimize um, both physical, but also the cyber attacks on the system. And, and we're actually evaluating this on, on a test bed, on a virtual test, on, on a physical test bed that we have developed at GEOS. Uh, that uh, we are planning to open for people to use uh, remotely as well. So you are more than welcome to use it as soon as we have it online. Now for the detection of the events, we're using again chlorine sensors. And here when we have developed a methodology that uses, uses bounds. And, and essentially the idea is that by monitoring chlorine concentrations and by, by monitoring how much it reduces from those bounds, uh, as soon as it passes a certain threshold that we compute, uh, we get an alert. And, and this is actually, uh, we have extended this approach to consider uncertainties in the demands and the reaction dynamics using Monte Carlo simulations. This, this approach tries also to minimize false positives. This is very crucial for our approaches. And we have recently published work that calculates those bounds uh, analytically. Um, another, another interesting thing that we have done is that we have studied the active contamination detector, detection. Sometimes it's not possible uh, if there is a contamination event because of the large time delays may not po be possible to reach an optimally placed sensor. So what we have done is that we have designed a method so that uh, by, by cutting some, by closing the flows in some pipes without losing any uh, water supply, uh, we can actually change the flows in the network so that a possible contamination event. So we're closing the pipes with, a, with, a, with an X, and we are going to see now what happens to the water, to the contamination um, in the two cases. So you see that. So you see now that we have managed to change the flows in the system so that uh, the, the contamination goes to the sensor to this accurate sensor faster, and as a result, the impact, uh, the number of people affected, uh, is much much less on the right than on the left. So by reconfiguring the system, we can actually have uh, a, a smaller number of people affected due to contamination event. Of course, uh, to do this, we need to solve a, a quite complicated problem, but we have reduced this uh, using some serious relaxations, a simplified problem uh, that can be used using evolutionary algorithms. Now, how to respond to an event? Uh, for instance, we can use manual sampling to evaluate the impact so assuming that we have uh, a sensor saying that there is a contamination in this area. So uh, we don't really know where the contamination came from. So maybe uh, but we can estimate that it, sh it should come uh, based on the hydraulics. You know, these are the, the most two probable locations. So what we do is that we do uh, manual sampling at this location and we find that, you know, there is a contamination there. So this excludes this part. And then we go and, and sample at, at some other optimal location. Again, we get the samples. Here we see that there was no contamination. So we do another hypothesis and we evaluate this, this uh, quality here. And then 
uh, this uh, manual sampling here. And in the end, we realized that the contamination uh, could have occurred, can only have occurred at that specific location. We can also include sensor measurements um, uh, as, uh, as well, in addition to manual sampling. Um, we're using digital twins for events investigation. So the digital twins are essentially a combination of different algorithms that I've showed before. Essentially, we combine SCADA and GIS and models to create calibrated uh, mathematical models on the fly and do state estimation. And we use this to do risk estimation, sensor placement, manual sampling, as well as generate maps and forecasts for the first responders. In another work, we're working on, on drones for, uh, this is a case for water quality, uh, contaminate, for water contamination in, in surface water. So in, in at Gios, for instance, in the case when that is when we're suspect when we're suspecting contamination event, uh, and first responders go to the scene, we are designing methods for drones to go and collect uh, uh, water samples from different locations, analyze this, analyze this data, process this data, and then come up with a model of how contamination is spread within the, the water surface. And this can be compared with uh, satellite images. The key initiative that we have right now is um, uh, a high profile initiative uh, project is uh, Water Futures. This is an ERC project, a synergy project uh, uh, where the co PI is Professor Marius Poligarpu, the second in the photo, together with um, um, esteemed uh, professors from uh, Europe. Um, uh, and, and, and the focus of this work is about studying how, how uh, how the water distribution systems of the future will be. And uh, extending the things that I've showed before, we are working on explainable event diagnosis, that is explaining to the operators what is actually happening to the system and why there is an event. Uh, doing real-time risk assessment, again, this is very much related. Doing dynamic clustering of sensors and actuators, this, this is about um, considering different, uh, different sensors at different uh, scales, at the macro or at the, at the micro level, uh, for monitoring and control. Evolvable control is about reconfiguring the system and, uh, and uh, when there are changes, reconfiguring the system automatically without using human intervention. Transferring knowledge between systems so that when we, when we learn something, for instance, in Cyprus, and, to, and, and this has to, can be applied also in Jordan, we can do this in an easy uh, way, as well as fairness in control. So this is a very, um, a very uh, futuristic, uh, has a very futuristic outlook how to change our control decisions, for instance, how to allocate the salinated water uh, to different populations um, in, a fair, in a fair way, not just in an engineering optimal way, but also in a fair way. So in summary, uh, and I think I'm in time. So what I want to say is that events like this, uh, like the Nokia event can, can and probably will happen at some point in the future, even though they are rare event due to climate change, things change very rapidly. Operators and first responders may not be ready to manage them, so they need tools, they need to establish a water security plan, but they also need to invest in technologies to help them before, during, and after the event. Already a large number of research results are available and are already evaluated in projects. Some of these projects, uh, our, uh, we are leading them uh, in Europe, and uh, you are more than welcome to join us in this effort. Um, and also training on virtual environments is very important. We are developing this virtual city benchmarks, and we would be really uh, interested in having you using these, uh, these tools. And uh, as a closing remark, we have new and exciting research challenges ahead. Um, uh, we are very uh, keen in collaborating with, with, uh, with, the, with the Unimed network. And um, that is all from my side. Thank you for listening. Thank you so uh, much. Back to you. Yes. Eliades, right? Thank you so much for this nice presentation and uh, being very punctual. I didn't uh, have to exactly. give you this one minute uh, notice. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, well, yeah, uh, Dr. Ahmed is with us now. Um, uh, please, before we start with Dr. Ahmed, please feel free to post any uh, comments to uh, uh, Dimitrios on the chat. Uh, for the uh, QA session after. And now we're moving to uh, the speech on water energy nexus by uh, uh, Professor Dr. Ahmed Salaime uh, from the Faculty of Engineering at the University of Jordan. Dr. Ahmed, the floor is yours. 
Uh, yeah, good morning. Thank you uh, for this introduction. Uh, it is my pleasure to be today. Uh, so I hope that uh, I think that I have 15 minutes. So uh, I tried to make the presentations to be like uh, uh, in sequence of uh, the session today. So I will talk about uh, uh, water energy food uh, nexus and uh, especially uh, to present the situation in Jordan and uh, also about like uh, water management and climate uh, smart agriculture. Uh, so the, the contents of the presentations will be in addition to the climate smart agriculture definitions, the problem statements, we'll talk about the three uh, pillars that we have about like uh, current situation of water sector in Jordan, then current situation of agriculture sector in Jordan, and finally, current situation of energy sector in Jordan. So this is the three topics. And then we will introduce the concept of water, energy, and food nexus, and the proposed solution for uh, Jordan. So uh, about what is the climate smart uh, agriculture, CSA, uh, it is an integrated approach to closely link the uh, challenges of food security development and the climate change adaptation mitigation to maximize the benefits and sustain the resources. Uh, so the Climate Smart Agriculture aims to tackle three main objectives, sustainability, increasing agricultural productivity and income, adapting and building resilience to climate change, reduce or remove greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, about the situation in Jordan, if we start with water, as you know that water scarcity is the most acute environmental uh, challenges in Jordan, and uh, less than 100 cubic meter of renewable water resources is available per capita annually, and sources of water, we have about 27% surface water, 14% treated water, and 59% uh, uh, groundwater. And the estimated water demand the quantity for all sectors is about 1,400 million cubic meters in 2017. Uh, the groundwater level is the main aquifer drops at a rate about two meters per year and reaches five to 20 meters uh, in others. Also population growth and uh, refugee influxes increases the demand and the demand for domestic water in the Northern Gabon Nets has increased by 40 percent due to uh, refugees. Uh, existing aquifers will completely depleted by 2030 because of the impacts of climate change and unsustainable water usage. Also, uh, in Jordan, water sector is the largest electricity consumers, and now we have this like the nexus between water and uh, energy. About 15 percent of our electricity goes to water pumping. Uh, electricity consumptions continue to grow due to the groundwater depletions that requires pumping water from lower levels in Jordan Valley, especially, and the increased water desalination projects and the increased water demand. Yeah, in the future, we'll need more energy because we will go to the water desalination, which needs a huge amount of energy. Uh, and one of the challenges that the uh, Ministry of Water faces is the, the electricity bill, which about like in 2017 was about 160 million JD. And the, the prices or the tariff of electricity has been also increased from 0.09 JD per kilowatt hour to 0.115 JD per kilowatt hour. And about 65% of operational and maintenance cost of like a, a water authority goes to the electricity bill. So the financial sustainability of the water sector is threatened by growing energy expenses that cannot be covered by growing revenues. Also, farms discharge large quantities of uh, agrochemicals, organic matters, a drug, a sediments, and uh, also sediments and saline drainage into the water uh, bodies. Uh, Severe deterioration of water resources equality due to agricultural activities has been witnessed in many areas recently in Jordan. So uh, about agriculture sector in Jordan, 
Now, this is the second uh, pillars that we have. Jordan is a food deficit, a deficit country and depends heavily on irrigated agriculture due to the low precipitations. Climate change, which is a global warming, irrigated crops will be increased, and agriculture comprises a relatively small share of GDP. Only 3% of Jordanian GDP uh, is related to the agriculture, which is uh, very low compared to the like to the water uh, consumed for agriculture sectors. Uh, Ninety percent of the area receives less than 150 millimeter rainfalls in the whole country in Jordan. Only five percent of total area are arid lands received between 200 and 300 millimeter per year, and four percent of total area receives more than 300 up to 600 millimeter in the north part of the. Uh, also, water resources contributions to the agriculture for groundwater contributes about uh, 46 percent, surface water 30 percent, wastewater contributes about 25 percent. Uh, due to the water scarcity, treated wastewater effluent is added to the water stock for use in irrigated agriculture, and the quality of a provided water in King Abdullah Canal is not suitable for the sensitive crops. High salinity and the chloride concentrations may be determined to certain crops. Also, 60% of agriculture in Jordan depends on rainwater, and 40% is irrigated agriculture in highlands and Jordan Valley. And 40% irrigated agriculture produces 90% of total agricultural products. So this is about the percentage of like the olives, how many dunams covers about the uh, 1,000. Then we have cereals, uh, then vegetables and fruits. In there. Also agriculture sector is the largest water consumers, more than 52 persons with only, as we said, that three percent contribution to the uh, GDP. Uh, energy consumptions for irrigations use uh, made uh, about 0.33 kilowatt hour per cubic meter, according to the Jordan Valley Authority. Now about the Jordan, about the energy, this is the third pillars that we have. Uh, Jordan enjoys a world-class quality solar and wind energy. So we are located in the uh, sun belt which we receives about five to seven kilowatt hour per meter squares per day. Uh, currently, photovoltaic is used in, uh, in the country, and uh, Jordan is considered as one of the highest, uh, highest country in the Middle East with renewable energy projects. Uh, the, if we take it uh, the share per capita, so we are, I think, that in the number first in the country, uh, if we uh, re remove hydropower, since we don't have too much hydropower projects. Uh, yeah, currently, uh, we are importing about 89% or 90% of our energy from outside. And this costs about 10% of Jordanian GDP. Uh, and the annual growth of primary energy is 2 to 7%. And for the electricity, is about 3%. And 60% of oil derivative is refined in Jordan a petroleum. As we said that uh, we have now, by the end of 2021, we'll have about 2,400 megawatt comes from renewable energy projects, mainly from solar energy and uh, wind energy. Also, the oil shale projects in al Aparat, uh, which will produce 15% uh, of the kingdom's needs of electricity will be operated soon. And uh, the maximum peak load that we have is about the uh, 69% of our like uh, productions uh, capacity, which means that we have access of electricity in Jordan, so we don't have any shortage in electricity. So now we comes to the water, energy, and food nexus. These concepts could vary around the world depending on the shore middle and long-term goals of the regions and sector. So virtual water deals with the productions, water footprint deals with consumptions, integrated water resources management deals with entire life cycle of water, 
while Nexus deals with life cycle of water and other related processing, including energy, land, and food. So uh, as we said that food production demands water, water extraction, treatment, and uh, redistribution demands energy, and energy production also required water. So we have this like circle. Energy inputs via fertilizers also transport, irrigations, etc., have their influence on uh, food prices and envir environmental pressures and the climate change, as well as growing economics, eco economies and populations uh, intensify the existent relations between the three systems. So, yeah, if we look to this uh, graph, we have this, uh, the three pillars, energy, water, food, and we see that uh, we need energy to produce water, especially for water desalination or water treatment. Uh, also, we need water for uh, energy generations, for energy pooling. Also, you need water for uh, food productions uh, and, and irrigations. And uh, so there are these like concepts that uh, uh, also the cost of energy affects the cost of food and, and et cetera. Uh, so, uh, Improved integrated management of water, energy, and food would generate trade-offs that can enable Jordan to identify new policy to increase resources security at a time of global economic and environmental change. Primary challenge in Jordan is to increase the productivity of water used in irrigated agriculture by both reducing losses and unproductive water use and shifting cropping patterns to include production of higher value crops. So for water food mixes include activities reducing water consumptions and increase its efficiency for producing food. Environmental activities of the water food mixes include examining food imports and virtual water mixes. Water energy mixes, energy for water uh, and water for energy. Examples, for example, of consuming water for producing energy include hydropower generations and biofuel using water. Energy consumption examples include pumping water for food and treated wastewater using electricity. But the concept of water energy food mixes, we have several activities related to biofuel, concentrated solar power, woody biomass for producing electricity, irrigation reform, investigating land, water, energy requirement, etc. So I, I think that this example, I, uh, you can also have the, 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 the presentation, but uh, I think that uh, maybe the time will be a little bit uh, to discuss this in details. But we have here, for example, uh, about water, food, uh, water, energy, the, the elements that we have as also examples, water, energy, food, the climate change also, the, so this is, I think that the, the examples are written inside this slide. So proposed solution for Jordan context. So we have to develop a smart tool and we already started with some partners uh, from Texas AM, from AUB, from Qatar foundations. They developed a software that interconnect energy, water, food, uh, use low cost renewable energy such as photovoltaic to provide needed energy for water pumping, water desalination, irrigation systems, build the capacities of farmers in optimum utilization of resources, list the high value crops that have higher net return per cubic meter of water, using new technologies that saves water, uh, such as uh, hydroponics, uh, and uh, conduct different types of research needed by researchers, apply nature-based and low-cost methods for decentralized treatment of gray water to be used for agriculture, maximize run rainfall harvesting, conduct frequent stakeholders meetings with representatives from public and private sector as well as civil society uh, uh, to allow participation of these stakeholders in the development of Nexus community in Jordan. Uh, um, this is a, yeah, I, I finished this. I think that for the gray water, I will uh, skip it. 
since the uh, I know the time. Uh, so this is about the green water, uh, the gray water used for irrigations, and uh, this is the smart tool for water energy food nexus. As we said, that we have the software, we have this tool was designed by Texas AM team, which uh, identifies the linkage between water energy and food, and you can uh, insert the, the parameters, and then you can also have the output, the tool uh, could be used to achieve the holistic management uh, approach. So uh, this is the last, uh, I think that, uh, I don't know, Dr. Rashidat, how, how much time do, do we, I have? Actually, we're done. So if you can conclude, okay. you, 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 you finished your 15 minutes. <laughs> okay, so okay. The, the last minute, this is about the smart tool for water energy food nexus. I think that this software is uh, very productive, can be used to define uh, the quality, the quantity inter uh, linkage between water energy food nexus, and also propose the scenarios. And we, for database creations, we input all this data, we can have them as input, and then we can have the output uh, about uh, the plans, about the, the, the market price and local energy requirement, etc. So I think that uh, now uh, in Jordan, we need this smart tool for water energy food mixes because these three pillars are connected to each uh, other. Sorry that to take uh, more than time. And uh, in fact, this, uh, these tools that uh, maybe we can discuss it later if you have any questions or uh, during the discussion. Thank you very much for your listening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, of course, the floor is open after uh, on the chat box. Uh, please feel free to post your comments. And um, there will be a, a debate uh, led by uh, Martina uh, later on after our last presentation. Uh, please uh, allow me to uh, get excused. I have to leave right now. And I will hand the microphone to my colleague Riham to uh, introduce our next speaker. Uh, I have to catch up with the funeral of our colleague, uh, Professor Hussain. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you everybody for being with us. And uh, I really apologize for having to leave this early. I, I wanted to stay with the, for the debate and the discussion, but hopefully uh, during our next meetings. Thank you. Uh, I'm leaving. Uh, goodbye, everybody. And we have the, the, the mic is yours. Thank you so much. And thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so to Dr. Uh, Ahmed for his uh, presentation. Okay. And actually, thank to all of our speakers for today's session. They were all amazing. Now let's move to Dr. Fuad Khalaf from the School of Engineering at Cairo University. Dr. Fuad, the floor is all yours. Please go ahead. Dr. Fuad, do you hear, do you hear me? Dr. Fuad? Okay, so shall we take some questions, Martina, before, okay, Dr. Fuad is here? Okay, he's, he's here, perfect. Doctor, we can't hear you actually. Would you please unmute your speaker? We can see the presentation, but we cannot hear the yeah, voice. Yeah, we can't see the presentation indeed, but we can't hear your voice. May I unmute you? I don't have that. Uh, uh, you are muted. Do you see the red button beside your name, Dr. Fuad? Would you please unmute it? Martina, can you unmute him? Uh, I can try. Can you hear me now? Okay, perfect. We can hear you. Thank you, sir. Is that okay? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, okay, I'll start. Excuse me. Uh, this is the first time I have been with some people. Okay, my, my talk will be on ex 
assembly concepts of systemic risk management to all other sciences dealing with under that event. And I learned a lot from the previous presentation because we can share a lot of, a lot of things. Okay, my approach. So, sorry, Dr. Fuhad, uh, we can hear your voice, but it's very far and it's difficult to follow. Hello? Is that okay? Is that, is that okay, Mom? Uh, still, we, we cannot hear you very well, but you can, you can just try and we'll see uh, how it goes. Thank you. I don't know what I should do. I go out and then I get in again. Um, maybe we can join from you. It, it sounds like your microphone is very far. So we hear a lot of noise, but we hear your voice very low. Okay, so. Uh, do you see the screen at least? Yes, yes, we can see the screen. Okay, Pierre. Maybe what uh, I should do, I go to, I go through the screen very, very rapidly and then. Uh, Okay, my, my, my approach will be based on analogy, analogy of several factors, history of, uh, of sciences around the events. I followed, I followed the term safety disaster and hazard and all of this in the Google in the grand book that starts from 1800. And you see on the screen the evolution and the frequency of use of these terms. I tied these terms with the consumption of energy. And you notice that probably after the third, Second World War, frequency of using undesirable terms such as hazard risk management, resilience, danger, and all of this has increased after 1975 and exponential increase after the 1990. Okay. This for worldwide disasters. These disasters are documented I see here and they feel more or less the same things. These are disasters of pollution, nuclear disasters, earthquakes and elements. Okay, rapidly, the industrial, the ISO, ISO body, the International Society for Organization issued certain directives for optimizing the procedures for uh, undesired events that could happen and the last one for resilience was issued in 2017. This was a little bit 30 years later than the total quality. Very rapidly, we follow what we call a systemic approach. We put every undesired event into a system, and our system includes four major components, the creatives, the infrastructure, the environment, and the work processes and culture, culture of the place, the culture of the individuals. Why this approach? Because it includes all sources of hazard.
لو بيكتب ان اي سيستم تو كونترول اي من عند ذات ايفنت ات از بروتكتس بيرسونال بزنس اوبجيكتيف اي اول اوف ذا ريسورسز فور ورك اند فور لايف اجينست فورمز اوف لوس اند دامش ذس Efficiency of control is we use it as a measure for the efficiency of the way we face the undesirable mental system can be extended to resilience. Okay, if I compare the analogy between the management, the most of them they address the, the resources for the business, the capability of getting this. System back to recover, continue to work. This is resilience. Management tries to protect, protect the resources against sources and damage. All of them will handle resources. One is reactive, like resilience, and the other one is proactive or reactive. Resilience has some. Some meanings and different disciplines. It is the capacity of coping in social sciences. It is bouncing back in anthropology. It is business continuity in business. Or all, all, all the others they handle or the try to predict resources. We are. These procedures used to protect the resources are in the, in the, uh, in, in the risk approach, it is proactive. In the resilience approach, is, it is reactive. But most of them can be extended to the other and the use of risk management in the resilience can add value. Okay, this is a model of definition based on the systemic approach in which, in which we define the resilience or the risk in each one of these ever the risk the same to the environment and the crisis or the resilience. Okay, there is a process, five step process, common movement risk, and this can be extended to resilience. I'm just uh, not going to ask. It is a total quality process, a composed of five steps, and these are moved to manage problems. Forcing uh, entities, forcing systems, causing loss of resources, and this can be applied to resilience also. There should be a paradigm shift, a, a different way of thinking to be able to adopt the systemic approach. We should. Any system should include this nine, nine prerequisites in its operation. If this is managed well, this will reduce all, I mean, all kinds of losses and damages to the system. Okay, there, there is also a process we call holistic, perfect approach, systemic, not systematic approach, we use it in this, it is more than the linear approach because it makes a multitude of relations, if I have an N component, linear approach will give me N minus one relationship, but the systemic approach will give me N times N minus one relationship. This one with a systemic approach will decrease emissions, uh, losses, mis uh, I mean, uh, unavailability data will be aware of. Okay? 
why system thinking? Because it's often expanded view, reduces chances of remission, ensure completeness of analysis. We need also to inject a concept we call it cellular. Cellular is the step where the system produces much more than the output of its component. So system thinking broads broaden the vision and some of you called for hom homogeneity. Uh, continuous improvement, consistency, and both of them are necessary for targeting total quality. Okay. We have near, near mess, we can handle, I mean, less, we can handle small elements or big elements. And resilience, most probably, the events and the accidents are macro. Okay, here is the opportunity for common research, global research to. I mean, a cooperation between those who are working in Venus, they can benefit from the progress realized in this. Okay, there are challenges facing the both of them. I mean, most of, I mean, we have this in the form of a uh, iceberg model. The top of the iceberg contains Losses and probabilities, most of them are known. There is no problem to handle this. But the most problematic part is the hidden part. Vulnerability behavior today, exposure, no perception, no harmonization, no trust, political and cultural issue. This view is very useful because we, it makes us always look for something that we don't know. The characteristics of systemic thinking, resilience, and risk awareness are a high level of diversity. We need to benefit from diversity, not to ignore. Diversity will manage, will be a lesson for progress. However, connectivity, because we use systemic analysis, a high level of building all of this form in order to face known or unknown challenges. Okay. In conclusion, resilience of systemic uh, and system thinking and risk are complementary branches. Resilience amplifies factors of nature. Systemic thinking will detect the micro factor not accounted for, and the human made hazard mostly handled by risk I have common concerns which is natural, known, and unknown factors. A risk Effective system is likely to become a more resilient and uh, and faces a lot of stressors and so on. applying system thinking mutually beneficial and contributes to sustainability, risk management and resilience or Give us either peculiar resources and knowledge more than ever to synergize our ever growing need for progress and achievements and facing future problems. A recommendation here in the last slide the scientific community should invest into a ten transdisciplinary data related science with satellite science. The center will die then, will continue to flourish this way long term, um, and also all these sciences will be there, 11, from risk knowledge to the results of management, they will be built in one core science, we call it the science of Beijing. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, sorry for this uh, problem. I, I don't know what happened uh, to uh, this. Uh, and thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Fuad. Thank you for this presentation. Now we shall move to you, Martina. Let's have uh, yes. uh, some thank you, questions. Rehan. Thank you. 
So uh, we have concluded with the presentation and I hope they have been uh, interesting for you all. Um, I am not an expert in the field, so I could follow only to a certain degree, but I, I guess it was very nice to have so many different uh, inputs and so many different perspectives when we talk about water and water infrastructure. So uh, it was still um, very nice to have all those inputs on behalf of our uh, speakers. Um, there were no many comments in the chat, but uh, um, there was a question to Dr. Jaime uh, from the University of Salento um, on behalf of uh, Dr. Mamoun. So I still uh, would like to um, take the chance to um, do the question, even if Dr. Mamoun had to leave earlier, but he might be able to join uh, to, to see the recording and still follow up with your answer. So the question was, um, or is comment and question, uh, was related to water leakage. So um, he said that there is an important issue in Jordan, especially related to leaking networks to the different factors. So he, the, his question was, uh, can any of these leakage det detection systems be installed in old water networks? And what is the projected cost for such, such system for a network which is length about 100 kilometers? So I, I, I okay. leave the floor thank to you, you uh, Dr. Jaime, to answering his question. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I thank you for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to reply, to give a, a response to the colleague. Um, living outside. Um, the, in my opinion, uh, uh, in practice, the cost of the uh, sensor to be mounted on the uh, pipeline is around uh, um, 160 uh, euro per, per piece per item. And uh, uh, you need, in the case of uh, a hundred kilometer of uh, pipeline, um, I think that uh, we need uh, to uh, implement a system of uh, uh, giving, uh, delivering energy uh, per any uh, location where sensors are uh, mounted. So in my opinion, we are working here in Italy in this aspect, uh, the costs per station, uh, with the station I mean the sensor, the uh, energy uh, system with the photovoltaic and the cost of the transmitter based on the LoRa, long range system could be uh, here in Italy uh, I think around uh, mm, around uh, half half thousand euro per station. But I think that since the uh, the, the the pipeline uh, is more or less linear, it is not a zigzag system. We don't need a lot of uh, sensors to be mounted. On the uh, on the power pipe pipeline. If the system is linear, uh, uh, hundred kilometers, I, I think that it could be would need, uh, for instance, uh, 20, 20 or thirty uh, stations. Okay, but but I am available for uh, um, uh, counseling activities. For this, we can we can work together. No problem for that. Okay, thank you, thank you very much for your answer. You are welcome. Your availability, but um, um, so you think this is can be installed also in old water networks? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. Because if if the material is metallic, is a simple. It, if it is a polymer, uh, instead of using the transducer. Uh, I show you, we can use the uh, something related to acoustic, like a belt uh, to put around the pipe. Okay. But, 
he can contact me. Of course, um, if you all agree, if your speakers all agree after the, uh, the meeting in the next days, we will uh, share the registration of the webinar, the presentations and also your contacts. So our subnetwork members and the participants today can eventually get back to you if they have additional questions or in, in this case, if they want to have a specific consultation on one or another issue. And then there was a question for uh, Dr. Demetrius from the University of Cyprus. And um, I think it's an, a very interesting input on behalf again on Dr. Mahmoud um, to having the possibility uh, for the University of Jordan, but as well, I imagine for the other universities in the network or other universities involved um, in joining the partnership for designing smart water futures initiatives. So Dr. Demetris, the, the word so, to you. Uh, yes, yes. So I'm, I'm really uh, thankful for this, uh, for this uh, uh, question. Uh, I, I mentioned this, of course, during the presentation, but uh, it's very critical for us to, uh, to communicate and, and, and collaborate with people in the, in the region, in the Mediterranean region, especially uh, in, the, in the area close to Cyprus, as you know, we are neighbors. Uh, so, of course, it's very, um, well, specifically for, for the water futures, uh, we are planning to have, uh, to demonstrate different technologies at, uh, at, different, at, at different countries with different levels of, uh, of advancement in water distribution networks and with different challenges. So, uh, I would say that uh, this is definitely something that is of interest uh, uh, to us. Um, and, and in fact, we have been trying to establish some collaboration networks with the, with the, with the broader region. Uh, I mean, of course, we collaborate with the European countries, but it's very important for us to also collaborate with the MENA region, uh, the Middle East and Northern Africa region. And um, that's why I mentioned that we already had collaboration with the Arab Water Council. And, we, and um, so um, I, I've shared my email and uh, uh, please feel free to contact me and we can arrange for uh, you know, for uh, after the webinar, maybe in the next couple of uh, weeks, we can organize a meeting to uh, exchange, to, to share and communicate uh, how these uh, technologies can actually be evaluated or tested. Not everything is ready to be applied in the field, of course. Some is more theoretical, but um, we are we are we are very much interested in in, in talking with you. And in closing remark, just to say that Cyprus uh, suffers uh, a lot. Uh, has the same uh, is in the same let's say trouble religion from from a point of view of water. Cyprus is an island, uh, but we, so we, we are not connected with any other country. We have uh, we have we are facing the same water shortage shortages as as you as the people in in the in this region are facing. So we have a lot of droughts. We have every eight years we have essentially we have intermittent water supply. So we know what's happening. We rely on desalination. So uh, I, I would say that uh, you know we we are sharing as a European country we, we kind of have both uh, we are facing both the advances in the technology but also at the same time uh, the challenges that are faced in our in our region. So please go ahead and contact, contact me and we will follow up this discussion. Thank you, thank you very much. And of course, I can also put at your service the Unimed network. You know we have. Um, behind the sub-network, uh, we have a huge network of universities in the Mediterranean region, so we can, of course, uh, we'll be able to join the conversation and see what we can do in the future and how to um, strengthen relation with the researchers in, in the MENA region. Um, there are no other questions in the chat. Um, I don't know if uh, our participants or our speakers still want to have a word about um, any of the topics we have discussed so far. Um, please uh, raise your hand or just uh, write in the chat, shall you have any more question? Um, otherwise, okay, there is um, um, a raised hand from Dr. Fouad. Uh, I don't know. Is that okay? Uh, very badly. <laughs> I must confess, you. you're still very far away. <laughs> what, what, what I'm uh, um, asking for, I think, uh, Doctor Doctor 
‫אה... ‫-אה... ‫חלדון. ‫דוקטור חלדון מתוך הבעיות ‫שורטוויזם עם ג'ורדן. ‫אני מבין. ‫הוא חד מאי, ‫זה פרובלם ווטר אישו, ‫הוא אומר, ‫אם זה בפן זה אונדר מאי. ‫שוב, זה פרובלם ווטר אישו, ‫זה פרובלם ווטר אישו, ‫זה פרובלם ווטר אישו, ‫זה פרובלם ווטר אישו, ‫זה פרובלם ווטר efforts to benefit from mutual resources and mutual resources. Have you cut it? I mean, uh, uh, you hear me? Dr. Fuhad, I'm not sure I actually got yeah. your comment. Uh, it was something about shortage uh, and Egyptian experience, but it was very hard to hear your voice. I don't know, Riham, I saw you opened your mic. Could you? Oh, just, uh, I, 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 <laughs> sorry, maybe I can write it. I wrote something yeah, in I, the chat. Yeah, we would prefer, Dr. Thank Dr. you, Dr. thank Dr. you. Please, so, so we can pass it to Dr. Khaldun before he leaves. Yeah, please. Yes. And in the meantime, I have another um, question in the chat from uh, Dr. Antonio Leone, Professor of Regional Planning. Um, he had a question about the presentation on, on River Jordan. Um, so I think uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm just checking who to handle the question, but the question was about, is about, is there evidence of agricultural non-point water pollution sources, fertilizers and pests? I think it was, Heeded to Dr. Hamed Hassalai Meh from the University of Jordan. Actually, Dr. No. Khaldun mentioned about Khaldun. the river. Oh, yes, yes, sorry. I remember the University of Jordan, but I wasn't sure who was the speaker. Yeah, uh, but I think this question should be addressed to him. Dr. Khaldun, do you, do you hear us? Yes, I hear you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the question was about if there is evidence of agricultural non-point water pollution sources, such as fertilizers and pests. Yes, like uh, some of the studies that have been conducted uh, in the Jordan uh, River Basin uh, have shown that there is proof of uh, non-point uh, water pollution. Uh, and actually, I would be happy to share uh, uh, some of these uh, papers and uh, researches with uh, Antonio. If he can uh, provide me with his email address, I, I will share uh, some of the recent uh, uh, findings on these uh, issues. Perfect. And actually it's on, on River Jordan and on the highlands of Jordan. So we have uh, uh, seen this in many different uh, places. Okay. So that's uh, interesting, and thanks for your uh, availability of uh, getting in contact with Dr. Antonio Leone. I wish I will uh, share you. Uh, I will share with both of you um, the contacts, so we can you can go in details into the conversation about that. Okay. Um, and I see there's the Dr. Fouad. Uh, he he's asking about potential cooperation uh, between countries facing water shortage and those exposed to potential water uh, shortage. Uh, see, uh, we are always looking for partnership and for uh, expertise in this area. So, uh, uh, and we are always trying to reach other partners uh, uh, for their help and for us to help them giving Jordan's experience in this area. For example, if I want to talk a little bit just for about wastewater, Jordan, uh, the, the wastewater in Jordan is uh, now considered uh, one of Jordan's renewable water resources, as I have said. Actually, we treat and reuse almost 80, 90% of our wastewater is treated and reused. And the percent served in Jordan uh, by, by uh, uh, 
wastewater, uh, wastewater treatment plants is about 67%. Now, we can reach up to 80%, and this is by uh, planning. And we need to move toward uh, decentralized sanitation options and so on. We have good experience in this area, and I know that we can help in this area. Now, we can get help from other people in, in, in many different other aspects. For example, the uh, reservoir project that I have mentioned, this is based on a new technique that we are considering images and satellite readings to look at, to do groundwater management. So this is a new technique that was uh, uh, funded, this research was funded by uh, the European Union uh, under the program uh, PRIMA, for PRIMA. And we are hoping that at the end of this project, which is supposed to end in three years from now, uh, we will have some good results that we can apply to other groundwater basin all over the Mediterranean. So just to be short, for Dr. Fuad, uh, also I will be sharing my email now and my contact information, and I'm looking forward if we can do some type of cooperation. And we've already have established previous cooperation with different Egyptian uh, researchers. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comment and for heeding also the question of Dr. Fuad. Of course, the whole purpose of having those conversations is about sharing inputs and sharing experiences and getting to know each other and getting uh, each other contacts to follow up on uh, the researchers and uh, you are all conducting but also maybe to um, take advantage of the funds available uh, you mentioned the prima program uh, there are funds from the Commission, uh, the New Horizon Europe uh, um, program, which is about to be launched, uh, and so on. So um, what I will do and what I will take care of is to share each other's contacts so that you can um, move on in the conversation. Uh, this wants to be the starting point and not the very end. So the idea of having those webinars, uh, starting from uh, the one we held today, is exactly to... Uh, leverage on, on each other expertise and experience and, and, and move on in the, in the cooperation uh, between the uh, members of the sub-network. Um, so if there are no any other comments, I would leave the floor to our sub-network coordinator, the University of Salento in the person of Professor Ficarella. He was the very one initiator of our sub-network on critical infrastructures, and he has been um, pushing us to have um, those conversations and to have this webinar series and to move on in the cooperation in the field. So please, Dr. Ficarella, the floor is yours, and I'm happy to add the word to you. Thank you, Martina. Good morning to everybody. I would like to thank to all the organizers, all the colleagues, all the friends for this very important uh, webinar. Of course, I would like to say this is a first step in our strategy to strengthen our cooperation and our collaboration. And I think that it will be very, very important to think about our cooperation, how to strengthen our cooperation, and how to identify the very important, uh, you know, strategic objectives that uh, we would like to uh, reach, to, to, to attain. But, uh, you know, as I told you in other, during other meetings, uh, we can also start a different kind of collaboration. For example, not only thinking to future projects, but also in a very simple way, for example, sharing uh, some PhD, some degree, thesis, uh, you know, it is very easy uh, to collaborate, uh, uh, to be, uh, you know, uh, supervisor uh, of, uh, uh, as I told you, degree thesis or PhD thesis, just for, for example. I would like to conclude also speaking about the next webinars. As you know very well, we are thinking to organize another webinar about water 
um, security, water system security and resilience, but uh, uh, in, in this case involving uh, external stakeholders, uh, because we think that uh, this will be a very important added value uh, to involve uh, external stakeholders, so, you know, public utilities as well as industrial companies in our activities, as well as, uh, as you know, we are thinking, thinking to uh, new topics for future webinars like health, pandemic management, cyber physical security, natural disasters, and also uh, security of food, security of uh, um, energy, uh, and so on. So I think that, I hope that we will be all together uh, to carry out all these uh, activities. And again, thank you very much for this. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ficarella, Professor. I see also the other colleagues from the University of Salento. I don't know if they want to say just hello. I see uh, Antonella Longo and Claudio Petti. We have been uh, with, with them and with the colleagues at the University of Jordan. We have been uh, talking and working a lot. And I have to say um, it has been a, a great pleasure. And I want to thank Reham in particular for her great work of coordination with the speakers and, and uh, with the, uh, in arranging all the details and um, I don't know if uh, thank if you very much you wants to say something else and want to greet our participants Maybe just a few words. Uh, 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 maybe uh, uh, Professor Ficarella told everything uh, interesting and useful at the moment. Uh, we have currently on uh, uh, some uh, calls related to uh, Erasmus Plus for mobility and uh, uh, also for capacity building and strategic partnership. Uh, as far as I can see just uh, in the chat, uh, there is a big interest uh, for all the participants at this, uh, at the, uh, in this webinar to find a good, uh, um, a good, uh, uh, good collaboration. Because, and uh, I think that we can, uh, um, we have uh, um, complementary skills all around uh, critical infrastructure. So maybe these uh, first opportunities of collaboration can be very easily uh, um, uh, forced in the in the framework of uh, UNIMED. So uh, maybe uh, in this, uh, my my colleague Claudio Petti for the mobility part can be more detailed, especially for the mobility of students, researchers. Uh, would be great if uh, students from our um, respective university, PhD students from our respective university can start collaborating on these fields. Thank you, Antonella. Thank you very much. And again, yes, I renew on behalf of UNIMED the full commitment to facilitate uh, the, the cooperation among the researchers and the university in the Mediterranean region on one or another topic. Um, you know, I'm, I'm completely not an expert in the field, so I will rely on you on uh, pointing the aspects on which collaboration may be taking place, but I'm at your full disposal, me and hold the UNIMED network and the UNIMED secretariat in here in Rome to facilitate the process. Uh, if I can just, I do not want to make it long, but uh, I've been called into action. I just want to, to greet all the colleagues and I hope that we will be able to meet with the ones that we did not meet virtually again, but in person soon. And uh, a lot has been said in this uh, event and uh, almost all from Professor Ficarelli Antonella. What I can add is just to reinforce the commitment to make this network not just a network of intelligence, let's say immaterial, but also a network of exchanges, real exchanges for which uh, we have quite a good experience of interdisciplinary research and academic and student exchange programs, also with the Mediterranean area. And uh, 
and I hope just that uh, I just reinforce my commitment, but everybody knows to have uh, make this from the project side, but also from the procedures and logistical side, very smooth and pleasant for uh, the network, either here or either in other places where our uh, members are based. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Claudio. And thanks to all the speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, yes, I, I agree. Uh, I hope we will be able to meet in person. I think we are all tired of, getting, uh, of doing things through a screen. So we have to be confident that uh, uh, the pandemic will be over one day, or at least we will be able to, to live with it. Um, and hopefully the next occasion will be in person. So I um, want to thank you all, thanks to the speaker, thank the participants, a big thank to the University of Jordan and to the University of Salento for all the effort. And it will be my duty now to um, share all the resources with you and share each other's contacts and, and follow up with you uh, after this very interesting webinar. So have a good continuation of your day. Thank you very much and goodbye everyone. Goodbye. Have a nice bye -bye. day. Bye. 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 Take yeah, care. Have a good bye. one. Bye. Bye. Have a nice bye. Day. bye. Bye. Bye.